Hi there, ladies and gentlemen. It's James Marley here from Livewire Markets, and I'm joined by Tim Carlton, Portfolio Manager at Ozcap Asset Management. And there are a bunch of big headline issues that are at the front of mind for investors at the moment. I'm going to be sitting down with Tim now to discuss a few of those topics ahead of a really in-depth webinar they'll be giving in just a few weeks' time. Uh, inflation, Tim, that's the big one. It is front of mind. It's the front of the newspaper. Um, should people be worried? And do you think we're likely to see significant inflation domestically? Well, it's extraordinary, isn't it? The US just printed 7.9%. The last time it was that at that level, uh, CDs had just been invented and were being, being rolled out to the public for the first time. That was 40 years ago. Uh, and we sit here today, even post the recent hike, with a Fed funds rate at 0.5%. Back then, the Fed funds rate was 15%. So we're in an environment where inflation looks like it's more persistent. Now, we're not seeing those sorts of numbers in Australia, and there are a few reasons for that. But if we just think about broadly, why are central banks suddenly worried about inflation? A year ago, they thought that a lot of the inflation that we were seeing at the time, or starting to see at the time, was going to be transient. They blamed it on supply shocks, the fact that there were rolling lockdowns in a lot of countries, and the fact that everyone was stuck at home. And as a result, there was pent up demand for goods. And so a lot of the inflation that we saw at that point in time, they thought would dissipate over time and in fact reverse. Fast forward to today and what's the difference? We have tight labour markets. We've got a tight labour market in Australia. We've got tight labour markets in a lot of the developed countries around the world. And as a result, you're seeing wage growth accelerate. So in the US and the UK, the two central banks that are responding most quickly to elevated inflation, we're seeing wage growth of 4 to 6% per annum. And that compares to wage growth sitting around 2% for much of the last decade. In Australia, we're a little bit behind where they're at. In Australia, we're seeing wage growth of 2.3% and we're seeing core inflation at 2.6%. So that's only the midpoint of the RBA's target 2 to 3% band. And there are a few structural reasons for this, uh, one of which is the fact that we have enterprise bargaining agreements that are typically two to three year agreements in Australia. So it takes longer for tightness in the labour market to result in persistent and higher wage inflation. Uh, and there are uh, you know, public service agreements that only roll off once per annum. We do think inflation is likely to be forthcoming. Um, so we, th we think we're going to see an acceleration from here and we think we'll see wage growth continue to trend higher, but, but probably at a slower rate than the US. And as a result, the RBA will be on a slightly different path to uh, the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England. The other headline topic at the moment is conflict in Europe, which is obviously um, the, the, U uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, which is a, a, a disaster. Mm. Um, is that something that factors into your thinking or how are you thinking about that with regards to um, investing? Oh, to be honest, first and foremost, you know, I guess our, our thoughts and prayers are, are with everyone, every innocent uh, party that's affected by that situation. Um, if we look at it purely from a, a markets and economics perspective, uh, Russia's GDP is about 1.6% of global GDP. It's only a fraction bigger than Australia, despite the big population difference. Australia's about 1.4%. Um, and so, uh, you know, we need to think about it within that context. The Russian economy is, does not have a huge level of significance um, to the extent that, you know, it's now got some issues um, uh, in a global context. Probably the main impa impact is what happens to some of their key exports. And in some respects, there are some parallels with um, the deterioration in the Australia-China relationship uh, a year ago, in that China stopped importing a lot of products that were produced domestically, with one exception being iron ore. And obviously the exception in Europe at the moment is oil and natural gas, right? And, and the reason for that was the extreme dependence of both economies on the supply from, in their case, Australia, and in Europe's case, Russia, for uh, steel making and energy needs respectively. Uh, in terms of the rest of the exports that are being affected by trans trade sanctions and the like, uh, we think that, that that trade will just get rerouted elsewhere. I mean, we saw it with Australia that a lot of the soft commodities and other hard commodities that we produced that were originally getting sent to China ended up going elsewhere and that actually happened remarkably quickly because ultimately you didn't have demand destruction. So China still needed to import the same amount of wheat, they just got it from elsewhere. And as a result, elsewhere there was suddenly a shortage and Australia filled in those gaps, right? So you had a rerouting of trade um, and probably higher transportation costs, but ultimately the product still found its end demand. And we suspect the same will be the case with Russia. You'll, you'll see a drop in the demand from 
developed countries that will probably be picked up at a discount by a lot of emerging countries. And again, so you'll see a, a change in trade flows. Probably the bigger impact is potentially um, what's happening to Ukrainian exports. Uh, and the reason for that is we suspect that there's not a lot of production going on at the moment. So they are material in certain categories like coin, corn, uh, 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 seeds, uh, uh, iron ore, uh, you know, and, and as much as it might be unfortunate to say this, in many of those categories, Australia is quite strong. So domestically, we'll actually see higher prices. It will be an unfortunate um, benefit to uh, the domestic economy because we are a very large producer of a lot of the things that the Ukraine uh, produce and we suspect that their production is actually being materially impacted. I just want to finish up on um, a, a question around valuations and portfolio positioning. So you talked about this new regime that we're heading into yeah. over the next decade. What are some of the implications around where you want to be positioned at a portfolio level? And um, can you also tell me what you're seeing in terms of valuations across the market at the moment? Sure. Well, well let's start with a headline. Uh, the headline level, uh, the, the market pulled back a lot, about 11% from, from peak to the trough in late January. So it was a relatively mild pullback. But within that, there was actually a lot of carnage. There were a lot of stocks that were down 30, 40, 50%. So the broader index performance was being masked by the outperformance of the banks and the major resource companies. But beneath the surface, there's actually been a lot of damage. And a lot of high quality companies uh, pulled back to levels that we found very attractive. And so then it's a question of, well, make sure that you are buying the, the right sort of companies for this environment. We think the time for buying profitless companies has probably passed. Um, they, they are at a natural disadvantage to the extent that we are in a higher inflation, higher labour cost, higher cost of doing business environment. They're going to see their discount rate increase. The um, share compensation schemes that have been used to attract a lot of talent don't work if your share price is falling. And if you're reliant on capital markets to fund your growth, this is not a great environment uh, for those sort of companies. By contrast, a lot of market leaders that are very profitable will actually do very well in an inflationary environment because they actually have the most efficient supply chains. They have the lowest costs of doing business. So to the extent that inflationary pressures whether it's supply chain issues, whether it's higher labour costs, impact every player in a category. The, the best in breed businesses will actually have an opportunity to expand their margins over time. So we've taken, we, we had about 10% cash going into the correction. We, we you know, didn't think that markets were pricing in appropriately um, the risk of higher rates. Uh, and we have deployed all of that uh, towards the end of January and then again towards uh, the end of uh, February uh, because there has been some compelling value on offer. So uh, we've just gone through a reporting season. A lot of the businesses that we own that we think are very, very high quality, good businesses that should benefit from a higher growth environment are actually trading on reasonably depressed multiples at the moment. So we've been selectively adding to, uh, to the portfolio and focusing on the highest quality businesses. So at the moment, you know, our portfolio has a weighted average historic ROE of over 40%, which is which is remarkable to put that in context, the ASX 200 is about 9.5%. So we're very, very happy with how we're positioned. And if you use this sell off sensibly, we think there's some very, very attractive opportunities out there. All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, folks, if you're interested in finding out a bit more detail around some of those topics Tim has touched on there, um, he is gonna be hosting a, a webinar that you'll be able to discover via the OzCap website, also through the Livewire email. Uh, you can tune in, there's a really detailed presentation with a lot of data, a lot of slides, and also some detail around their positioning. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, hit the subscribe button. We've got new content coming on our YouTube channel every week.